How to choose your partners, co-founders and investors and build a winning team. Well, after yesterday's session with Mr. Rahul Yadav, everyone must be wondering how to choose the right investors and co-founders. To give an insight on how to choose your partners, we have with us a person who needs no introduction. Without further delay, I would like to call upon stage Mr. Jim Beach, faculty head, School for Startups. Jim. Thank you. Hello, everyone. How are you today? All right. I want to start by talking about one central question. Why do you need a partner? Before we even discuss how to find a partner, I want to know why you need a partner. When I started my first business back 20-something years ago, 22 years ago, makes me feel really old saying that, I was the shyest person on earth. Do you believe that? Those of you who have seen me for a couple of days now, I am incredibly shy. I am the shyest person you have ever met. As a matter of fact, I am so shy that I didn't come here today. I sent someone else. This is really not me. I'm still at home in Atlanta, Georgia, hiding underneath the sofa because that's where I'm the most comfortable. And I know that you wouldn't be interested in someone that shy, so I sent another version of me, a version of me that has learned to be outgoing in public because one thing I've learned that being an entrepreneur, it's almost impossible to be an introverted salesperson. You know what I mean? Imagine how hard it would be to sell something if you're afraid to talk to somebody. And that's where I started off. So I have had to learn over the last 20 years that if I want to be successful as an entrepreneur, I'm going to have to be an extrovert, which I think is an important lesson for all of you to learn. And it's also important to realize that you have the ability to change your personality if you want to. All right, so I started off very shy. And one of the things that I've done to make myself an extrovert is I try to talk to every person that I run across. I hate doing it. I just, it's not my natural inclination. My natural tendency is to be shy and not talk to you. So when I go to a restaurant, I always sit at the bar. Well, one reason is I like to drink a lot of liquor, which also helps you become not so shy. But the most important reason is why do you sit at a bar as opposed to a table at a restaurant? To talk to other people, right? Isn't that why you're at the bar? Usually you're alone. Even now when my family and I go out, we sit at the bar because that's where I will talk to people. But anyway, when I started my first business 20 something years ago, I was so shy, I decided that I needed a partner so someone would talk on the telephone for me. I was too shy to talk on the telephone. And if I would have my partner, I would say, here's what we need to do. We need to call this person, and here's what you need to find out from this person. Find this out. Talk to them on the telephone. And I would sit there and listen on the speakerphone and write questions for him on a sheet of paper and put them in front of him. Because he's the type of guy, he would go into a bar. You all know a guy like this. A guy who goes into a bar or goes into a club or goes into school or whatever, and 20 minutes later has met 30 girls. You know that guy? Is anyone here like that guy? So I want to go party with you tonight. So that's the type of person I needed. And I was looking for a partner who did that for me, who offered that exact set of skills. I needed someone who was the exact opposite in terms of my personality. I was a shy introvert, so I needed an outgoing extrovert who was not afraid to ask anyone of anything. And I got that guy. Problem was, it turned out that he was the laziest person on earth. And he was also my best friend. He was the guy that, you know, he was just my best friend. He was the best man in my wedding. I was the best man in his wedding. And now we haven't spoken in almost 10 years. Isn't that sad? And you know why it happened? Because we went into business together. We were trying to do business together, and he, I needed his skill set. I needed someone who was willing to go talk to anyone, but it still made me mad. I remember very explicitly one time I, was, I got like $10 million in debt, personal debt one time. And I was about to lose my house, and they had written a letter from the bank saying, we're going to take away all of your stuff, your furniture, your cars, your clothes, leave your children, everything. We're taking all of it. And he went on vacation with the company credit card. <laughs> Think about that. Wouldn't that, I, I was sitting, his house wasn't going to be lost. My house was going to be lost. 
They weren't coming after him. They weren't going to put him in jail. They were going to put me in jail. And what did he do? He went to Jamaica with his girlfriend. 30 of them. And that really, really upset me. And because of that and a lot of other things, we've gotten to the point where we haven't spoken in 10 years. And I have a huge hole in my heart where my best friend used to live. And now I don't have a best friend. So I'm looking for a new best friend if anyone's interested in auditioning. Right? But it still, it hurts me to this day that the person that I was the closest with into the world, other than my wife and my family, you know, I have a brother that I'm very close to. But that's not the same as your best friend, is it? Aren't those always different? And I lost that person because we went into business together, because I chose the wrong person to be in partnership with, right? So today I want to present four or five rules that I'm going to give you about how to do, how to find partners, how to find spouses. Every single rule I'm going to give you also works for finding a spouse, by the way. I'm very good at finding spouses. I've been divorced and remarried and all that kind of stuff. So I'm very good at getting spouses. This also works for investors, it works for business partners, it works for friends, it works for everything, right? It's sort of an ambiguous test. And the first question is, is very simple. What is your personality? And by this, I want to introduce a topic called BOSI, B-O-S-I. Have any of you ever heard of this before? No? It's by an American author, a guy named Joe Abraham, and he did a bunch of research on entrepreneurs and found out that there are four types of entrepreneurs in the world. And I've used this hundreds of times, and I've never met anyone that it doesn't work for. You can go to Bozzi, D-N-A, Bozzi, B-O-S-I, dna.com and take a test, and it's going to tell you what type of personality you are. And there's four of them. The first one is B for builders. Who can we think of famous entrepreneurs that's a builder that, you know, they don't really care what they're building. All they want to do is build stuff. They build huge businesses, but then they move and jump to somebody else. What about someone like uh, Richard Branson at Virgin, right? Does he have any specialty? Is Richard Branson really good at any one industry? No, you don't think of him as an airline guy or a retail guy or a construction guy. What's Branson good at? Anything, right? He can build any business, right? That's what Virgin is all about. 300 different Virgin brands. So that's Builder. And we're going to put that in the upper right quadrant, okay? Next to that, we have O for opportunist. An opportunist is someone like me. I've done lots of different businesses. I've been in trucking, healthcare, real estate, beer, uh, bars, education. I've been in 20 different industries in my life. Retail, leather, uh, pork, beef, skateboards. Yeah, tons of different industries. I'm not really good at anything. I don't really have any industry that I'm particularly good at. I'm just an opportunist. You throw me a business, I'm going to go and do it. If I see an opportunity, I'm going to do it. I don't really care what the opportunity is. I'm interested in that. And that's one of the things you've heard me talk about, how passion. I don't really have a passion for any particular thing. right? I'm passionate about two things. right? Do anyone remember what they are? My family, my kids, and going to Disney World with my family or kids. That's all I really am passionate about. I'll sell any damn thing if I go to Disney World more, right? I really will. I, I don't care what it is. So then they say that you have to be passionate about what you do. I 100% disagree. I am passionate about my lifestyle, right? I have the coolest lifestyle of any person I know. I work at home. I wear what I want. I do what I want, I take naps when I want, you know, I do anything I want to. Isn't that a better lifestyle than being passionate about purses? I don't understand people that are passionate about a product. I don't understand that. Isn't that called materialism? In my world it is. So anyway, I'm an opportunist. I will do anything whatsoever. And we're going to put that in the upper right corner. So we have builders and opportunists. So far. All right, let's go through the S now. Specialist. What is a specialist? Well, obviously, they're good at one thing and one thing only. For example, Bill Gates. Bill Gates is good at building operating systems. That's what he's good at. Nothing else, really. We're not going to give him anything else. 
That's what he does. A specialist. You understand that immediately, right? Doctors, lawyers, CPAs, those are our specialists. And we're going to take that and we're going to put it down here in the lower left. So we have B, O, S, and then I, innovators, people that are like Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison was a horrible business person, but yet he invented over uh, 12,000 different things, I think. Right, of course, the phonograph, the camera, all sorts of stuff that he invented, right? He is not a business person. He would probably give away his product for free because what makes him happy is being in the laboratory by himself innovating new stuff, right? So we have B, O, S, I, all right? Now, what you want to do, here's the trick. You want to find out what you are. All right, so you need to go to bozzydna.com and take the test. Now, w- when you go out and find a business partner, they normally tell you you want to find someone that has the opposite skill set than you, right? If you're a marketer, what do you want to go find? A finance guy, right? Or if you're a finance guy, you want to go find a technology, right? The company that we just had up here, they had five co-founders. I bet you anything, one was a finance guy, the guy from Wall Street, they had a marketing guy, they had an industry specialist, they had a technology guy, and then they had another guy who was probably the the sales guy or something like that. Doesn't that sound like a good mix of people? A marketing guy, a finance guy, a sales guy, one person who can do everything. What happens if you put two innovators together? You have a marketing guy that's an innovator, and you have a finance guy that's an innovator. They're both down here in the eye. Both of them would prefer to be at home working in the laboratory as opposed to going out and building the business. So here you have the dream combination. You have a technology guy and a marketing guy and a finance guy, but they all have the same inherent DNA, and it doesn't work. So what I want to suggest to you is that when you're finding a partner, you go out and find someone who has the opposite skill DNA than you do. So if I'm a builder, I want to find an innovator. If I'm an opportunist, I want to find a specialist. This is infinitely more valuable than matching yourself based on what you studied in school or what your background is. Infinitely better. All right, so that's the first thing. The Bozzi DNA, I want all of you to take that test and find out what you are. It's amazing. This, the, the website and the book, again, it's by Joe Abraham. You should all read it. It teaches you that there are certain industries that a builder should never go into. There are certain things that an opportunist should never go into. And it will tell you where your career will be better off if you have a certain uh, DNA type. So you should go and study that. Um, think about this. There's all sorts of different types of dogs, right? There's big furry dogs and then there's mean dogs that come and bite your hands off, right? All right, if you were hiring a job description, right, and you were looking for a a person, a particular type of dog, and you wanted a lap dog, a dog that would sit in your lap that you could pet all day, would you want to hire the dog that bites your hand off for that job? You understand what I'm saying? It's the exact same thing with entrepreneurs. All right, so that's lesson number one. Lesson number two. If you are ever in a situation with anyone who wants to have 51%, run the other direction. Never, never be the person who accepts 49% of anything. And this is especially true in marriages, (laughs) right? In dating, right? There's nothing worse than you want 60% of their time and they're not willing to give you anything and you're always resenting the fact that they're not putting as much into the relationship as you are, right? Does that sound familiar? Any of you been married to that person? I was. There is nothing worse than having a business partner who wants 51%, but what does that tell us about that person? They're controlling They don't trust you. They think they're smarter than you. They think they're more important than you. They're going to tell you what to do. Are you comfortable in that situation? I hope not. And if you are comfortable in that situation, I really want you to think hard about why you're comfortable in that situation. You shouldn't be. 
A successful entrepreneur, I don't think, is going to be willing to accept being told what to do. Isn't that sort of the opposite of an entrepreneur? I mean, here's what it's, I think it's what you call an employee, right? That's not an entrepreneur. That's not a person who stands up and says, I think we should go do this. So if you find yourself in a situation where you are offered 49% of the business, the question needs to be, why am I not worth 50% of this business? You should be equals. And so every deal I do, I'm 50% or I'm not willing to do the deal. I also think that people who demand 51% are t uh, tyrants. And they're very insecure and they compensate for that by thinking that they have to be in control and yelling at people all the time. And so I find 51% entrepreneurs as yellers, people who like to yell at you. And I don't know about you, but there's nothing that I hate more than being yelled at. Do you like that? No, it's so horrible. And if you're the yeller type boss, you just need to get out and go do something else. So never accept a partner that demands 51%. It is a surefire recipe for disaster. All right, that's rule number two. Well, let's think about this. How, how are we going to do that with venture capitalists or angels? Let's talk about that for a second, that type of partner. Most venture capitalists, if you're really early on, are going to demand what percent of your business? A lot of times they're going to demand over 51%, aren't they? What do you think you should do then? Take it? Okay, but if I don't take someone's money, I'm going to go out of business. I have to have someone's money. And you always know what venture capitalists say. They always say, oh, we love entrepreneurs. We're on the entrepreneur side. We're the venture capitalist that loves entrepreneurs and is going to be there for you. We're the ones who, we like you. That's why we're investing in you. Right? Have you heard this, this story? Right? This is very stereotypical. That's the people that invested in me. They swore up and down that they thought the reason, uh, you're the greatest guy, Jim, we've ever met. We love your business. You are so smart. We can't wait for you to run this business forever. We love you. Guess what happened the next day? Guess. They fired me. The next day. It took them 24 hours to, to have their true colors come out. And so when a venture capitalist comes in and, and says, we'll give you, you know, $2 million for 80% of your business, and that's what it's really worth, and that's fair and all of that, the response needs to be, well, maybe I'm just not ready for venture capital yet. Why don't I grow my revenue for another couple of years and see if I can get to the point where we could be more equitable relationship? And I know that's very hard to do. When I accepted venture capital, I had to do it. Remember I was $10 million in debt? Remember that part of the story? And so if I didn't accept the venture capital, I would have lost my house and my cars and my family and my life and all of that. So I had no choice to accept it, but I still regret doing it. I really wish I had given away my house. That would have been a better deal because in the long run, it didn't work out well. So if a venture capitalist comes to you and says that, Turn it on them and say, if I'm so cool, if I'm so wonderful, why are you only giving me 30% of the business? Why am I only worth 20%? Because you keep telling me how great and how wonderful I am, but I'm only worth 20%. That just doesn't seem right to me. And see what their response is. I would argue that you're going to learn a lot about the venture capitalists when you reverse the situation and start making them audition, right? Because when you go to a venture capitalist, what are you doing? begging them to invest, right? That's how you appear, right? I do a lot of angel investing now. And when people come to me, they are begging for my money. Please, Jim, invest. This is a great company. You're going to love it. We would love to do business with you. Please invest in our business. That's how you sound like when you are going out there raising money. And so you paint yourself as someone who is begging for their money. And then, of course, you come across as weak. They treat you as weak. They demand more than the business is worth or more of an equity than they deserve, and you end up losing. All right? So third rule. All right, so rule number one. Well, I, ha I should have said rule number one, never choose a friend as a partner. Remember, that was the, the, the little thing about my friend Doug. His name was Doug, by the way. So when rule number one is never choose friends as partners. I love having my friends around, but they make horrible partners, right? 
Rule number two is never go into business with anyone named Doug. <laughs> yeah. Rule number three, learn what their DNA is like and try to have good opposite DNAs. Rule number four, the 51% rule, right? All right, let's do rule number five. Never have more than three co-founders, all right? You know, the guys who were up here just before, I don't know if some of you saw uh, uh, Mr. Seti, who was up here before, Sanjay Seti. He had five co-founders, but within three or four years, they'd kicked three of them out, and they were down to two again, right? You need to have a situation where... Everyone has a very valuable role to offer. Everyone has something to contribute. But on the other hand, you don't have so many people that eventually you're going to end up having a two-on-two -two or a three-on-two -two situation. Eventually, you're going to end up in a fight. Eventually, you're going to have a disagreement. And so always, always, you need to have a situation where it is compatible in a long-term dynamic. And I have never seen that work with four or more people. And I ask you, can you tell me a successful unicorn billion dollar company that has a, a group of co-founders, a large group of them? And I can't think of any. All I can think of is the other guy who got kicked out all the time. Or you no, know, at Facebook, at Facebook, uh, also known as Facebook, Zuckerberg, right? Let's just combine it, we call it Facebook. All right, Facebook got rid of the other guy who moved to Singapore. Did you see the movie? I don't remember the other guy's name, but they got rid of him and paid him billions of dollars to leave. Eduardo Savin, thank you, yes, that's right. And then, of course, there is Steve Jobs doing what he did to Steve Wozniak, right? And we can't say those words in public. But certainly Steve Jobs was despicable in the way he treated Steve Wozniak. And do you, do you notice when Steve Jobs died, what Wozniak had to say about him? Almost nothing. It was, he was being very, very polite. He didn't come out and say, yes, Steve Jobs was the biggest ass on earth. But just, you know that's what he was thinking. He was like, yes, yeah, Steve was a great innovator. <laughs> yeah, that's all I got to say. I got nothing else to say about Steve. That's the way he was. Look at the videos. Look at the interviews. You could tell that he still hated that man, right? I don't think that those situations work out well in the end when you have multiple personalities all fighting for the same prestige, which is going to lead us to our next rule. What are we up to? Number six now? Even though I want you to be 50-50 partners, or 30-30, or 33-33-33, even though that is where I want you to be, you must have one person in charge. There must be one person in charge. So even when I'm in a 50-50 situation, the rules are this. We are equal partners. <clears throat> we will fight it out until we both agree on a course of action. But I am in charge. Now what does that mean? I am in charge but will always have... 50-50 ownership. How does that, how can you gel those two very different things? Well, on any short-term agreement, I have the ability to do pretty much whatever I want. I'm going to be the one who makes short-term decisions. I can fire somebody, but you can too, right? We're both in this together. But if you fire the guy who's just about to finish writing our code and you get rid of our chief programmer, you better have a solution how you're going to solve that today, right? So no one gets to act really quickly and without thinking. But on the other hand, if we're just we're considering selling the business, I'm going to negotiate the deal and I'm going to bring the deal to you and together we're going to vote and until I can get a deal that is good enough, you're not going to agree. But when you agree, I'm going to sell the business. But I'm always going to come to you and say, here's what I want to do. And I'm not going to do it until you agree that it's a good idea. And this is a really powerful thing. If I can't convince my partner that it's a good deal, it's probably not a good deal yet. Does that make sense? So you want to be in a situation where one person has the right to do stuff. But on the other hand, you want to be able to know that you still have to make the deal good enough that your partner is going to go along with you. Does that make sense? 
By the way, I want to do a, a self-pitch right now. I want to promote something. Uh, this story of Doug and I, of the, my first business, which for those of you who don't know, I started with zero money and in seven years grew it to 700 employees and then sold it. And in the middle got $10 million in debt, right? But got out of the hole and you know, went on to live a happy life. I am doing that story as an entrepreneurial serial thriller podcast every week on my radio show. So every week I tell a different chapter in the book, so it's going to become a book eventually. I've done 23 chapters so far, so so far right now where we are in the story is the big bad evil billionaire has come in and promised to help us. And that's how we get $10 million in debt is by going into partnership with the big, bad, evil billionaire, who all of you know, by the way. So my, one of my partners in 97, 98, 99 was someone that every single one of you has heard of. I promise. Every single person in this room has heard of him. As a matter of fact, I've already said his name once in the presentation. So who, who have those been? Gates, Jobs, Wozniak, Zuckerberg. Branson, one of those people is the guy I'm talking about, but I can't tell you who. But if you listen to the story, you'll figure it out. So anyway, he, his son drives a Ferrari into the pool in the next chapter, so that'll be an interesting chapter. So anyway, every week I release a new chapter of this on my podcast um, called schoolforstartupsradio.com, and we're 23 chapters in now, and it's a fascinating, it's like a thriller. It's sort of like designed to be like a movie where you don't know if they're going to live or die and what happens in the end, and you know what happens because I am here today, I'm alive, right? All right, how much time do I have left? Five minutes. Five minutes. We need to start q &A. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. All right. My next speech I'm doing later on this afternoon, maybe immediately after this, is on bootstrapping how to start a business with no money, which is what I did, uh, what uh, I've always done. And so we have five minutes. Does anyone have any questions for me? Okay. Yes. In India, we don't have a major, you know, good platform for the B2B to help the, you know, small manufacturers. So what you uh, suggest to, you know, early stage of um, uh, B2B, you know, uh, marketplace to go to venture because B2B is a bigger platform, which is, sorry, with one money, it's not possible. So you have to go to or go to a venture, uh, VC. Right. So the question is, what do you do when you have to go get some money simply because of the nature of the business? And you're not going to like my first answer. My first answer is don't do it. Until you have enough money of your own or traction of your own that you can do it, I wouldn't do it. I think you're going to be at an incredible point of weakness and your chances of succeeding will be really small. Or if you don't like that answer, the other thing I would recommend is to find a partner that is in the B2B space that you can go to and be their first outlet. You could be their marketplace first. And so they're sort of like a sponsoring partner of you and you build your company based on them. Every company that I've ever built has been based on your brand name. So my first company was at Stanford and MIT sponsored by Intel and Microsoft and that guy's company that I can't talk about. Um, that company worked because I was associated with MIT and Stanford. I, if I were you, I would try to go to the largest silver manufacturer, the largest wheat manufacturer, and become their official guy and give them free service forever, right? And then that's how I would do it. But otherwise, you're going to give up 80, 90% if you go into the marketplace because your company is worth zero until you start getting some traction. Can you figure out a way to do it now for zero cost? I would spend tons of time doing that. So let me say this one more thing. Uh, I will answer all of your company specific questions. My rule is I don't like to do that here because it takes you five minutes to explain your company and there's a hundred other people who want to do the exact same thing. My email address is james.beach at att.net, james.beach at att.net. If you send me a page, I will read it. 
And I will respond back with either a whole long list of stuff or I might just write you back one sentence, which is what I think the critical question is. If you answer my question, I will continue to respond to you until you quit emailing me. All right, I promise I will respond to you. I will read everything that you write and I will respond with what I think is the most important question. But after, you know, it's up to you, all right? So if you have a, a specific company question, that's the best way to handle it is over email um, because I, I just know that that's the best way to handle it for me. All right, yeah. yes, ma'am. find a, uh, a partner with a different complementing skills, how do you trust being them as a co-founder and you won't be ditched at last moment? All right, that's a great question. How do you trust people? All right, so especially if you go to an organization like TIE, T-I-E, the Indus Entrepreneur, great organization, that's where I would go to meet my co-founder if I were you, okay? That's, you know, go find something there. I would do the exact same thing that I would do on my third date if I started dating you. On the third date, about 10 minutes after we've had dinner, I'm going to start a fight with you. All right, girls, get ready for a big fight on the third date. Why would I start a fight on purpose? I know that sounds really horrible. Why do you do that? To see how they fight, right? Anyone who's ever been in a relationship knows that you're going to get into a fight. So whether it is dating or with your founder, you want to see how they respond, and if they come out at the end and go, I'm sorry, I, you know, I apologize, you have to see how they fight. And I'm not gonna sign any paperwork until we've been doing that for six months. Just like I'm not gonna ask you to marry me until we've been dating for three years. But for founders, I want six months of you interacting with them, and the first time you see something that you don't like, you have to tell them. You know, you said you would have this for me on Thursday, today's Saturday, and I don't have it yet. What's going on? So press them every single opportunity. Press them. You, you said it was going to be done. Why isn't it done? You said you were going to call Bob, but you didn't call Bob. What's up? Fight back all the time. We got time for one more? No. No. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jim. Thank you so much. We would like to give a small token of momentum. Thank you for this great talk from IIT Bombay to you. Thank you.